We're finally here, it's home free, let's do this shit! In my first almost hour long video about Pokemon Sword and Shield, I came to the conclusion that the base game is kinda stinky. And in my second, considerably shorter video about the first half of the DLC, the Isle of Armor, it was revealed that Pokemon can still reach the dizzying heights of... Eh, that's alright, I guess. Ah, but this one, the Crown Tundra DLC. This is the DLC that I was actually excited for. Despite the Isle of Armor's intention to be mainly about growth, I found more enjoyment exploring the new locale and catching new Pokemon than I did with its lackluster story about a bear getting strong or something and Hop was there. I don't know, I don't remember, it wasn't very good. But hey, would you look at that? The Crown Tundra is supposedly all about exploration. It's also including all the missing optional legendary that were obviously cut from the base game for this expansion. Since Pokemon has long sensed any attempt of being difficult, stuff like legendary hunting became the next big draw for me in these games, especially since they automatically tie into my primary goal of catching them um all. Needless to say, if there was any kind of hope that I would have for this game, it would be in the Crown Tundra DLC. And luckily for us, or unlucky, however you choose to look at it, there have been no changes in the base game, so we don't have to talk about anything that has changed over time. We can just jump right into the Crown Tundra. So did it meet my expectations? Let's see. So the first thing I think that needs to be noted about this new edition is just how uninvolved the story is. Oh no! Is a Pokemon game story taking a backseat to the gameplay? That's a foist! It's no secret that the stories in Pokemon games have mostly been terrible, even in the best of the games. HeartGold and SoulSilver, I love those games so much, but the story, it's not good. The most engaging part of that game is that you like, engage Team Rocket in a radio tower before they disappear for the rest of the game. It's not good. It was never good. So as much as I would love for Pokemon to have an actually engaging story for once, it's not what I'm expecting. There's plenty of criticisms to be made about the Crown Tundra story, but I'm not really going to be talking about them that much because I don't care, and it's clearly not the focus. That said though, let's get the brief rundown. The beginning starts you off similarly to the Isle of Armor. You get on a train and you immediately meet the primary characters you will be interacting with, Peony and his daughter Peonia. Peony has apparently dragged his daughter out into the middle of a frozen tundra, despite the fact that she's clearly not wearing appropriate clothing, to hunt down some legendaries. Peonia immediately dumps her father off on you with basically no objection from Peony, and she basically fades away from the story until the end, so we're not going to talk about her anymore. Peony then takes us under his wing and sets us off to solve a handful of mysteries in the wilderness while he sits in the cabin all day. Which is nice, because if he was given much more screen time, I could easily see his character coming off as annoying. He falls more under the blindly eccentric character type, where he's constantly high energy and making everything seem exciting. He has a few jokes on land, but if he was a constant factor throughout the whole game, I feel like he would get really grating really fast. As a guide though, I think he's perfectly suitable, especially when he's contrasted against the quiet tone of what is probably the actual story. The primary legendary Pokemon of this DLC, Calyrex, is an ancient protector of this land who has lost his power due to everyone in the village forgetting who he is over generations. With our help, he is returned to prominence and his power is restored enough for him to join us. Playing through this questline tells us a moderate amount of information about this land, but for the most part, it's a shorter story than what the Isle of Armor even offered. While it's pretty disappointing on its own, that small scale also works in its favor, specifically when it comes to what little humor the story actually has. Pokemon continues to show that it has at least some self-awareness, as it indulges in the absurdist joke of characters conveniently popping out of nowhere whenever they're needed. Oh ho ho, isn't it convenient that the key item you need is right here in front of me? I was using it as a Hello, isn't that weird? The game also knows how to subvert its tone in order to go for a joke. I was surprised at how often this game actually made me laugh, which has now been said about both the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra. Due to the limited scale, I can't really call the story here good, but it doesn't waste my time. I'd rather hear this rabbit thing talk about its shitty life than watch Hop talk to a flower for five minutes. Anyway, here's basically the summary of the entire game. Rabbit was loved, now is forgotten. Had a cool horse, but then he lost him. Horse attacks some people, you meet him at the steeple, and now you have a horse rabbit, the end. Let us move on to the fun stuff now. 
Before being sent into the new wild area to explore, we are first introduced to the big minigame of the DLC, Dynamax Adventures. Going into this was something I was not excited about. Dynamax raids in the base game were terrible. They were just long, drawn out battles that were only worth doing at the highest level with other players online. Otherwise, you would get a group of smooth brain DLCs that would enter battles with a type disadvantage and spam cosmic power over and over, wasting everybody's time and effort. They were easily one of the biggest misfires of the base game, so when I heard this was being expanded on, I was like, I don't like it. But giving credit where credit is due, they managed to make Dynamax Adventures what I would subjectively call fun. In these Dynamax Adventures, you are forced to choose from a list of rental Pokemon which you use to battle through multiple Dynamax fights on the way to fighting a random Dynamax to legendary Pokemon. None of the fights here feature shields present in previous raid battles, which basically served as a fuck you, you are moving too fast and we need to draw this out a bit longer mechanic. As you beat enemies, you are given the option to capture them and then swap them out with your current Pokemon. This is something that I really enjoyed. No longer was I able to just use my level 100 Cinderace to melt through everything. Now I was forced to use Pokemon that I normally wouldn't use in any other situation. It is a constant game of making the best of whatever you are given and slowly trying to improve yourself by catching new Pokemon, aiming for healing spots, acquiring hell items, or gambling on a random rental replacement. The fights leading up to the final one aren't difficult, they're just preparations for the finale, although you still can lose in them, and if you lose four times in the entirety of your time while down there, you will be kicked out. Dynamax Adventures added just enough restrictions and limitations for things to become interesting again, but while I genuinely had more fun playing this than I did playing any of the raids in the base game, it also suffers from amplifying raids' worst aspects. So imagine this, you are playing a raid for a Pokemon that you really want. Now what if we make that battle take four times as long, where the determining factor of whether you win or not is located at the very end. Now imagine you are forced to play with CPUs, which have carried over all of their profound stupidity here as well. You could spend 30 minutes to an hour just making your way through the dungeon, only to lose it all for factors outside of your control, which is far worse than previous raids. For the most part though, the decreased difficulty of all these fights makes each encounter much more manageable, even with Pokemon that aren't your own, so I would still call this a surprising win for Crown Tundra. After you complete the story mode of Crown Tundra, you will get one last go at the Pokemon League as you team up with gym leaders of your choosing, preferably not Hop. This ends up being what I would consider a huge waste of time though. I just got done fighting level 80 legendary Pokemon and you guys couldn't even muster up the courage to have their Pokemon be above level 70? It's also a team double battle, which means everybody else gets three Pokemon each, but you get your full party of six plus your partner. You really have to try to lose, meaning that once again, Again, a Pokemon feature is only having any kind of worth if you're actually imposing some sort of forced restriction on yourself. There is a bit of character banter, but usually it's no more than a few sentences and it's really not worth my time. So I guess this is just for the weirdos who desperately want to team up with a 12 year old goth girl. Moving on to the actual exploration part is the new wild area. The wild area in the base game was basically one giant grassland surrounded by walls, with one teeny tiny little desert hastily shoved in at the end. Then the Isle of Armor was a huge step forward as it combined mountains, deserts, beaches, and a lush forest all together in one place, while still being incredibly easy to navigate as pretty much every area is connected to one another. A real shining example of how this new open world style of Pokemon can be designed. The Crown Tundra is different from the others though as it is more vertically oriented. Things are a lot less connected because it's all stacked on top of each other. There also aren't that many strikingly appealing original locations on this map. This little forest here full of frost moss were cool, but uh, you know, it's just a straight line. But this lack of originality makes up for it by having a much larger area with more places to explore and more secrets to find. Routes in the base game were basically straight paths, so imagine my shock when I entered one of these caves where I was met with like five different paths and even somewhat got lost during a moment or two. These kinds of large scale cave systems are something that was pretty common in pretty much every other classic Pokemon game. Even Sun and Moon had a decent cave system, but when making the jump to Switch it seems like Game Freak forgot how to make this kind of stuff and I had almost lost hope, but honestly they did a fairly decent job here. The cave is still pretty boring and it's all consisting of basically the same texture over and over and over, it's just a lot of brown, but exploring every inch of it was very fulfilling. The main reason the map is designed like this though 
shows to support the other quest lines. Pretty much every other Pokemon game has a plethora of optional legendary Pokemon encounters to discover and overcome after beating the main story outside of the big name ones on the game cover. Sword and Shield had a whole zero to encounter. No, instead we get the convenience of spending another $30 on an expansion and then waiting a year for us to get what was obviously supposed to be in the base game. Yes, I am still salty, why do you ask? The legendary encounters are now clearly divided and brought to our attention in the form of these quests given by Peony. One of these quests is to discover all of the ruins of the Reggie legendaries and solve the door's puzzle in order to enter. They aren't on the same level of complexity as in Gen 3 when you had to learn fucking braille in order to catch these low tier legendaries, but most of the puzzles in this game are just on that line of difficulty where they're satisfying to solve but are easy enough that little babies can still do it. Except the Reggie still puzzle, that thing can go fuck itself. Oh, I'm sorry, is ringing the bell of my bike not an acceptable answer for you? The hint literally says the ring. How is a whistle in any way more correct? It is the exact same thing, but it makes less sense. Sorry, I just feel stupid for having to look up a tutorial on a baby Pokemon game. Despite me clearly being right! Similar to the Diglett hunt in the Isle of Armor, you can find hidden objects scattered around the Crown Tundra in order to complete the Swords of Justice legendary quest. Unlike the Diglets, though, they took a route that makes it a lot more completable, but a lot more boring. You must find 50 items each, but there are far more than that, and they are usually densely packed together. This means that picking them up feels a lot less rewarding due to the ease of finding them, and their frequency means that there's just a lot of... makes this one of the more boring quests. The final quest is to find all three legendary birds from Gen 1 that have been brought back in Galarian forms. They all take form as this game's version of roaming legendaries. Roman legendaries used to be very rare and random encounters that could take place anywhere and once encountered they would immediately run away, and from that point on you would have to hunt them down continuously in order to battle or catch them. Looking at them now, this method of keeping certain legendaries really secretive is both charming and outdated. Nothing beats the surprise and excitement when suddenly running into a super rare Pokemon, but actively hunting them was super tedious. Sword and Shield tries to reinvent the concept by turning each of the encounters into a little minigame. The three birds fly across Galar, one to the Crown Tundra, one in the Isle of Armor, and one in the original Wild Area and it's up to you to hunt them down in a much more dynamic way than ever before because you can actually see these Pokemon in the overworld. Once found, you'll have to complete a small task, like outrunning Zapdos, or getting ahead of Moltres, or picking the right Articuno. Now, this is gonna sound surprising, but this isn't just good. This is great. This is what series are supposed to do as they grow. They address the flaws in previous titles and improve where improvement is needed, without completely abandoning and dumbing down the original concept. This is the kind of thing that, down the road, I would say new Pokemon games should always do some kind of iteration of this. That's the kind of praise that Sword and Shield does not get a lot of, so I am not saying this lightly. This is what I like to see. Good job, Pokemon! Maybe one day you'll fix that whole core gameplay and story problem you have too. One can only dream. That isn't the only minor improvement they made to Legendary Hunting though. Many of the Legendaries now don't suffer from fading to ash after you defeat them in battle. Which always seemed like an arbitrary restriction to me because you could always just save scum until you finally get the Pokeball to land. And trust me, there's a good chance that you're gonna need those continues, because these aren't those fake ass huge amount of buildup but then you throw a single Pokeball and immediately catch it kind of Legendaries. These are the classic eat up all your ultra balls like candy and kill your entire party through attrition kinds of legendaries. These can be extremely tedious as well, but since Pokemon games are lacking in any kind of challenge nowadays, it's nice to feel some kind of accomplishment for once in these games. For someone like me whose main appeal of Pokemon is completing the Pokédex, or at least so long as they keep making the Pokemon games super easy, this DLC offers pretty much everything I'd expect from the in-game content. It's got new Pokemon to catch, new legendaries to catch, new hidden Pokemon to catch, new hidden legendaries to catch, and has what is essentially an endless stream of previous legendaries constantly available at any time through a bit of challenge. Every other aspect of this DLC, from its story to its level design, ranges from passable to slightly above passable. There are real hints of charm here, and it makes me hopeful about the next entry in the series. I would give the Crown Tundra DLC a 6 out of 10.
Ugh, I thought this was a review for Cynix. This is getting too positive. How am I gonna retain the viewers if I'm not getting mad at every little thing? But how about we look at Pokemon Sword and Shield as a whole now? With the DLC considered, is Sword and Shield a good game? No. Even at its best, it's just passable, with a few highlights to remember for the dedicated fans. I would boost my rating up from a 4 to a 5 out of 10, but that still isn't great. Was the backlash justified after another year? Yeah. In fact, there should probably be more. We are out here paying $90, maybe more, for Pokemon Home and waiting a year for a mediocre complete product for the biggest franchise ever? Pokemon fans deserve better for their money's worth. But they go back to the positive again. X and Y sucked stinky poo-poo eggs, and then was followed by the massive improvement that was Sun and Moon. I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't like those games for various reasons, and for the most part it's kinda justified, but I will die on the hill that says they are actually pretty good. The quality of the DLC in Pokemon Sword and Shield shows an upward growth, and if that remains constant, then maybe, just maybe, the next game could be something we look forward to. Until then, Sword and Shield still suck!